Welcome back to the Prillerworks channel. My name is John and this is a video about making a big coffee table. Last year I made a mantle for our fireplace and said I would make a matching coffee table in five years or so. Well look who's ahead of schedule. The design of this table is fairly simple. It's essentially a box with a divider running the length of it. That divider will create a small shelf for miscellaneous things as well as two drawers. The tough part about this project is dealing with the sizes of the pieces. The overall dimensions are about 48 inches long, 24 inches wide, and 18 inches tall. The pieces are made of solid white oak, and here I'm starting off by making all of the panels. Usually I'll take panels like this in stages, I'll glue up half of the width and remill everything and then glue up the full width later. But this time I decided to glue up the whole width because the pieces were pretty flat and stable and I wasn't worried about any issues gluing them up properly. The outer casework needs a 1 inch finish thickness, so I purchased a lot of 5 quarter stock. The long divider is 3 quarters of an inch thick, while the short divider you'll see later is a half inch thick. I like using solid wood for my projects because it lets me easily alter material thicknesses, which I think can add a lot to a design. Playing with proportions is key. A huge table like this might look too light with 3 quarter inch thick material all around. In total, there were 4 large panels. I brought them down to final thickness at the drum sander. My drum sander is 22 inches wide, but open-ended. That means I can run these panels through once, flip it around, run it through again, and have the whole face sanded smooth. The only downside to this is how long it takes. With four panels and each face requiring at least two passes, square the denominator, and carry the one, I probably spent two hours moving these things around. Next, I carefully jointed one edge before ripping the panels to final width. The long divider is inset an inch on either edge, so I ripped it two inches narrower than the outer case pieces. After that, I squared up one end with my track saw. And then, I finally gave my 52 inch table saw fence a reason to exist. I know this is not the safest cut because of how oblong the panels are, but if you focus on keeping the material against the fence as you move it through the blade, you should be okay. I'm not necessarily advocating anyone do this, but it worked out okay for me. Even though you can see the board pull off the fence ever so slightly, everything turned out fine and my pieces were nice, even, and square. That said, I am in the process of brainstorming an MFT and PARF style workbench for crosscuts just like this. The joinery for this table will primarily be dowels. I'm using the dowel max and 3 8 inch by 2 inch dowels. I decided to make the sides surround the top, which meant I could cut the top, bottom, and long divider to the same length. Because of that, I'm drilling into the end grain of the long panels, and then I'll cut into the face grain of the sides. So I've transformed this jig so that it can drill into the face grain of my material and I have to get the spacers correct so that everything lines up at the corners. So I used an eighth inch spacer on the other boards I just drilled and that's the correct spacer to use for inch thick material. So I'll use that here. But what I also like to do on a lot of my casework and even small boxes is to add a sixteenth of an inch spacer which makes sure that the end grain is one sixteenth of an inch proud of the face grain and then I'll come back later and flush that up with a flush trim bit. And the reason I do that is because it's much easier to just flush it up with a flush trim bit than it is to run the risk of having your face grain being proud of the end grain. You can solve that with sanding and, and a hand plane but there's always going to be a noticeable dip. Uh, or bump or something like that that is noticeable to the touch. Uh, and so I just like to purposely mitigate that by adding this 16th of an inch spacer. And that makes sure that everything in this dimension is lined up perfectly. And to compensate, as far as my plans are concerned, I added an eighth of an inch to the length of this piece because it's a 16th for each side. Following on what that guy said, this isn't 100% necessary, but I found it's a good way to make sure the corner of a butt joint looks super clean. Here you can see what that extra sixteenth of an inch overhang looks like, as well as a sanity check by me to make sure the case went together okay.
The long divider is set down 4 inches from the top. After a little bit of measuring and careful setup, I drilled the dowel holes. Keep in mind, since the divider is also inset an inch, I had to start these holes an inch from the edge. While the holes in the divider can be started from the edge just like normal. Luckily, I had enough material left over to make the short divider. This was a glue up of 10 or 12 narrow pieces which allowed me to keep proper grain orientation with the rest of the table. My initial plan was to drill quarter inch dowels into this piece, the long divider, and the top panel. But after doing so and trying a test fit, something was out of alignment and I did not get any video of it, so I do apologize for that. But to fix this, I routed a long mortise in place of the dowel holes. I used the router table for the small piece and a plunge setup for the large pieces. An undersized piece of plywood would act as a floating tenon and give me some wiggle room side to side to allow the rest of the case to go together nicely. Just like the mantle I made, this table will be stained a charcoal or a black brown color. In this case, I decided to use Rubio Monaco. This or any normal stain would be tough to apply to the inside faces of a piece after glue up, so I finished the inside and hard to reach places before gluing everything together. I did a lot of sanding up to 220 grit, raised the grain with some water, and sanded back that raised grain. I also masked off the areas that will need to see glue. This was my first time using Rubio Monocoat that wasn't a little sample bottle. I used plastic syringes to get the correct ratios and mixed the two parts thoroughly. Application is pretty straightforward, you just spread it around, in this case I used an old AAA card. For pieces towards the ends, I used a white Scotch-Brite pad. Once I finished spreading the finish on one piece, I came back and buffed it completely dry with fresh shop towels making sure to go with the grain. A little really goes a long way and since this is a two-part mixture, and an expensive finish, it was a bit difficult to know how much to mix. I ended up mixing a total of 80 milliliters, which was just about perfect for the amount of material I had to finish during this stage of the project. And finally, it was time for the dreaded glue up. I don't usually stress about glue ups, but I had a similar design go haywire earlier this year because the dowels I used were way too tight. So this time around, I made sure each and every dowel fit into its hole nicely. After doing that, I was left with 30 or so dowels that were too tight. After measuring them with calipers, they were only 5 thousandths or so of an inch bigger than I needed, but it really makes a difference, and the glue up in this case went much smoother than the other one. Anyway, for a longer open time, I used Type-On Hide Glue. This glue doesn't swell the wood and lets the pieces join together nicely. I pieced together all of the panels, including the short divider and its plywood tenon. Since all of these pieces are solid white oak, this whole thing is very heavy. Assembling it vertically made sense because of the orientation of the pieces, but it also made my clamping setup a bit awkward initially. I carefully rotated the table onto its base and got started with the clamps. I used a total of six pipe clamps, as well as some F-style and parallel clamps. You'll notice I ended up adding some clamping blocks to the pipe clamps. These help to evenly distribute the pressure. Also, I didn't have enough long clamps to put pressure on the long divider, so I hooked two parallel clamps together to span the distance. As you'll see, this took me a few attempts, but it ended up working just fine, and all the joints were closed tight. With the glue up out of the way, I can start running down the other side of the mountain that was this project. I used a flush trim bit to even up that sixteenth of an inch overhang I mentioned earlier. And those little torn fibers left by the router bit weren't too deep and were easily sanded away later. Being the hand tool savant that I am, I whipped out the low angle jack plane to smooth out the edges of the table before hitting them with a 15 degree chamfer bit. I decided to use this odd angle to try something new. I wasn't able to go as deep with the chamfer because the bearing would have hit the inset dividers, but I still like the look overall. And when routing on something like this with not much support, I like to use my free hand 
as a guide that provides that support against the work surface. This helps prevent tipping in either direction. I also added an eighth inch round over to prevent any sharp edges hitting little kiddos or resting feet. With the main table mostly done, I turn my attention to the drawers. I'll mostly gloss over the technical construction because I've gone over the half bind lock joint a few times before. We had the choice of one drawer that can span the width of the table and pull out from either side, or two drawers that would butt up against each other. We figured the two drawer setup would be harder for our daughter to mess around with, so that's what I made. The drawer fronts are from a really cool piece of walnut I picked up at one of my lumber suppliers. It was an old floorboard I got for about 5 bucks. It has some awesome grain, along with a few spots I had to fill with epoxy and CA glue. The drawers were mostly able to fit the table, but I gave them each a really light pass on the joiner to get them perfect. And by perfect, I mean they were just okay. I did a little bit of final sanding and edge treatments before applying finish. The drawers got my usual walnut oil, while the table got the rest of the charcoal Rubio Mono Coat. I applied it much the same way I did before. In this case, I had the two sides which were vertical, so I had to get a little creative to apply the oil without dying. Even though this stuff is expensive, I think it's a really approachable way to stain a project. Instead of applying one or two coats of stain, letting them dry, then adding a few clear top coats, you can just apply one, maybe two coats of this stuff. The only possible downside is it leaves a matte finish, but I prefer that in most cases, so it's all good for me. And to backtrack a bit because I can't time my voiceover, I added some felt pad to the underside before flipping it over to do the rest of the table. The biggest key in applying this finish, at least from my experience, is to get as much of the excess off the workpiece. If this becomes a mainstay in the shop, I'll probably invest in some sort of buffer to help make that task a little easier and more reliable. The last and final step, besides moving this behemoth into the house, was to add the drawer hardware. We went with these pointed oval poles from Lee Valley. I don't have much else to say about them besides I think they look really cool. And that's about it. I still needed to add some stops so that the drawers can't be pushed through, but that'll be a project for 2021. As I finished this table, I had a few other design iterations pop in my head mostly playing on different drawer configurations. One was a stack of drawers continuing under the ones already there, and another was using the bigger part of the shelf as small square drawers, similar to my apothecary cabinets. Anyway, that's all I have for this one. If you're interested in seeing stuff like this while it's in progress, follow me on Instagram at Perlaworks. Thanks for watching.